Well, hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Brand Builder Show. And one of the most important things for your e-commerce business is sourcing high quality products at prices that make it possible to make a profit. And that's exactly the topic we're going to be discussing today with, uh, I wanna say one of the most experienced people I've actually met in this space, and that is Yulia. Yulia, welcome to the Brand Builder Show today. Hello. The way you said one of the most experienced kind of make me feel old by now. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't want to make you feel old, but I do want people to it know is what that it is. you are yeah. legit. Yeah. I mean, how long have you been doing this? What was it, like 17 years or something? 18. Yeah. Since um, 18. I was close. Since I moved I was to China close. in 2005. It's been a while. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that that journey, obviously, um, because that really plays into what we're, we're talking about today. Sourcing is obviously such a massive part of uh, successful physical product business, you know, e-commerce, uh, bricks and mortar, wherever it is. You know, if you're sourcing, uh, if you're selling physical products, you've got to source them from somewhere. And and so, uh, yeah, I'm excited to dive into the topic today. But to give us that bit of background, uh, what have you been doing this last 18 years? What's been going on in your world and what has brought you to this point today? Well, I actually spent about nine years living in China. Then I spent about uh -huh. two and a half, three years living in Singapore. And I've actually been based in Germany since 2017. Um, back in the day, I came to China because I was studying there in a British university. And at the same time, I always wanted to have, you know, some pocket money, let's put it this way. So I got a job as most of the Russians back in the day did uh, in a sourcing company, but uh, I went a different way. I didn't work for a Russian company because they pay crap. I started <laughs> working for international companies. That's how it kind of started. And I always was in the business, but at the same time, I also, also worked in the category management, product management. I worked for one of the competitors of AliExpress, uh, also a Chinese company called Light in the Box, Mean in the Box. I had a job offer from Alibaba, but at that time we were moving actually to uh, Singapore. Um, yeah, I kind of stayed in the business on and off. Um, and a few years back when Corona hit, um, a lot of my old customers, they started coming back and saying, Yulia, China is closed. Help. <laughs> what are we supposed to do? So yeah. this is how my company kind of started. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, fr from that point on, when I started doing this on my own continuously, uh, and it turned from, oh, I want some extra money for some extra shoes, uh, it turned into a proper business. And we're kind of around about 60 women right now because uh, our company is an all-female company, except my husband, he's the only lucky guy. Um, <laughs> except when we have vacations and all the women start to talk about pregnancies and giving birth then as well. um, yeah and uh, like we've people started getting to know us uh, we started off on the German market now we have customers all across the globe uh, Amazon uh, private label brands so Amazon brands are one of our Amazon themselves is one of our customers um, you know, really? but uh, we also work with uh, retailers. We work with people who just want to have a small business on the side. Um, yeah, we're trying to be helpful because we are Amazon sellers and e-commerce sellers ourselves since 2014. So we know how hard and tedious this road can be. Um, so yeah, yeah, we just try to help out as much as possible. And uh, sourcing is not easy. And um, a lot of people need kind of a lot of help with this. If you get this right, you know, um, you also need to get other parts right after that. But if you get this right, it sets you up for a very, very long time. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I'm a firm believer that, uh, you know, the, the foundation of a good e-commerce business is, is high quality products. It's not just getting some cheap crap made and, and selling it. You know, those days are gone. You've got to have good product as, as your foundation. But as yeah. you said, it's getting harder. Um, you, you know, the ability to drive profit good profit margins it gets more difficult if you don't know how to source well and so i'd love to uh, you know talk about some of the costing sides and how you can be as efficient as possible in the second half of our chat but i'd also love to hear more about the global sourcing side of things because it is certainly a growing topic of conversation uh, you know i know in our community I'm often getting questions. I did a, a call the other night with um, you know a bunch of our community, and they're asking, "Well, you know, we don't feel comfortable uh, sourcing in China for various reasons. Mm. What are our other options?" So I, I suppose my um, you know my first question for you would be: Are the concerns about sourcing in China uh, are they warranted, or are they people just getting worked up about nothing? 
Honestly, I'm not Nostradamus. I can't predict anything, but look what the hell is happening in the world. Look, I come mm. from Russia, war started, right? It's going to be almost mm. two years. Look what's happening in Israel, Gaza, all mm. of those places. It's insane, right? Yeah. Um, openly and honestly, I, I give you an example of our products, right? We have two brands. We launched the first brand in 2014. Initially, yeah. it was all made in China. Now, it is made in China and in India. Our okay. second brand, all made in Germany. Why? Okay. because of numerous reasons including the political situation but also it's not only politics that we're looking at if most of the people that you have in the group they're selling in us and they're buying from china yes they look at political instability they look at trump tax right additional 25 percent on so many items and god knows what else is going to happen in the future um, another corona is going to hit we had the customer who had uh, goods worth of uh, half a million dollar stock during the Corona times for like almost one and a half years. They couldn't ship or anything, right? The, the factory was closed. Um, but we found him other factories in other countries, right? That were still open and the factories were operating. So he actually managed to keep his business afloat. He needed to get a lot more money to invest again into manufacturing. So yes, concerns, uh, openly and honestly, concerns are warranted. Um, this is actually what I'm mostly speaking about right now. And I'm trying to educate the not only uh, e-commerce community, right? Amazon communities about a hybrid supply chain, at least consider hybrid. Do you know what a hybrid supply chain is? Well, I imagine you're talking about sourcing in China as well as somewhere, somewhere else. You've got options of where you source from. Exactly. But it's not only about having those options, it's actually setting up your supply chain where you're sourcing your products at the same time from two different countries, right? So for some of the customers, what we've been doing, um, and I do suggest to look into this um, for many different reasons, including shipping costs, shipping time, the financial turnaround that you will have, marketing, right? So let's say you can still produce 70% of your quantity in China, but 30% in a different country. People will say, oh, but the quality is going to be different. You know what? Every time you manufacture your product in China, every time Chinese New Year happens, all the workers leave, more than 30 percent, uh, no, more than 70 percent will leave and never return, meaning 70 percent of new workers are going to be there. Your quality is going to be different as is. So you can bring the quality to be equal, whether it's China and another country. Right. So this is something to consider. It's not having a backup, but directly producing in those two countries or three depending on your quantities. So, yeah, that's a big deal. I think the first question that I know I have and a lot of other people will have um, to begin with is just the ability to produce different kind of products, right? Because China, uh, obviously, is not as cheap maybe as it used to be because uh, globalization, prices of labor is going up, you know, they're becoming more on par with other places in the world. So it's not as cheap, but they certainly can produce such an incredible range of products at high quality at scale, uh, unlike anywhere else in the world, really. So then, you know, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, obviously, this is, uh, you know, my perspective, but it, it then becomes about where maybe is the best location to source a certain type of product, um, you know, or uh, tell me if you're seeing it differently. Are there locations in the world that are rising up that might be able to rival China in terms of the range of goods they can produce? India is up and coming for sure. You have Vietnam, you have Indonesia, but uh, in the few years, give it five or 10 years, then do you know what the next up and coming country is going to be where China is investing all of its money, where China is building factories now? No way. Well, take a guess. Try. It. Um... <laughs> I mean, you put me on the spot here. Uh, no, not good. <laughs> uh, um, I want to say maybe Pakistan. It's not a bad thought. And Pakistan is one of the up and coming countries where you can already produce. And China, of course, is investing there. But China is pouring crap load of money. There's no other way to say it. I think in the last uh, in the last five years, they put in about twenty five billion dollars African continent countries in uh, oh. on the African continent. Why? 
Lots of people, very cheap mm. labor. Uh, the governments need the money, so they're taking those donations from the Chinese government, who mm. helps them build roads, build bridges, build factories. Uh, Mexico as well, but Mexico investment is a little bit lower in comparison to the African countries. Um, they're investing mm. a lot of money, and they're sending people there, Chinese workers, engineers, to train the locals as well. Um, yeah. But to answer which countries can be used right now, look, tons. But the biggest ones, I would say India is um, has quite a range of products. Uh, anything from textiles to home decor to electronics, right? Um, to food products, uh, furniture, uh, products made out of metal, uh, paper, pulp manufacturing. Um, I know for a fact that one of the largest publishing companies in US, they produce most of their products in India, not even in China, right? So actually, India is a very, very good country for that. Yeah. And for the people that maybe uh, would have concerns about the infrastructure, obviously, there's with China, you've got things like Alibaba, you've got things like lots of shipping coming out of China. Are there uh, concerns that you have with infrastructure? Or again, are they uh, maybe naive concerns and each of these countries does have good infrastructure in place no, for the don't. average no what, concerns, what are the challenges? concerns are very valid they do not of none of them have infrastructure that can rival china look most of the countries in the world don't have the infrastructure that can rival china uh yeah. it, it 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 it's just the fact um but they're yeah. building up Again, they're investing money because they see potential future in this. I know uh, for, again, for a fact that very large corporations that produce, uh, I don't know, uh, automobiles, right, cars, um, they produce electric scooters and things like this. They're setting up, they're, some already set up and they're setting up more and more manufacturing facilities in those countries. The more bigger companies go in there and tons are going, the better infrastructure is going to grow, grow, grow. Is it perfect right now? No. One of the biggest problems and one of the things that people should um, kind of take note of is, um, you know how in China, when you're producing a product and it has five, five uh, or 50 different materials in this one product, mm. the Chinese will not yeah. have a problem. They know uh, I have an auntie here, an uncle here, a laoban there, a jeje, a meime. So all of those people, you know, have a factory and they can easily produce the product. You don't need to go to 50 different factories and put those things together. In other countries, this is kind of an issue because they don't yet have this massive communication like the Chinese yeah. have. Um, they are hungry for business, so this is developing. But again, India is getting better. You do need to understand the culture of the country where you're trying to source in, right? Um, and understand how they're communicating. Um, for example, I'm in Hong Kong right now, right? Uh, I, I'm a speaker at the Global Sources um, uh, Expo uh, tomorrow. And I, of course, went through the trade show today, full day. And uh, oh, how I miss this. Hello, dear lady, lady, <laughs> stop. <laughs> you know, all of those things. So as funny as it sounds, those are the cultural differences. Some of the people are going to say, oh, my God, why is she? Why is she so weird? Why is she call me dear or darling? But we need to understand those things when we go to other countries as well. The way people communicate with you in India, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, right? In the Philippines, everyone will call you ma'am, sir. You need mm -hmm. to tell them five times, five times, stop calling me ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So India, a very wonderful country to consider. Oh, ooh, Turkey. Turkey. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, sometimes a little bit hard to deal with them, uh, yeah, but, but it's kind of, I think it's the mentality. They kind of try to cheat you from time to time, uh, yeah. but they just call it doing business. Um, but <laughs> the, <laughs> the, they have a wonderful range of products, uh, anything from diapers to cleaning, to sh uh, hygiene stuff and cosmetics. Um, uh, food pro so food products, teas, plastic manufacturing. Plastic manufacturing is quite big in India. You know, for example, those like um, a fr a fridge uh, transparent storage containers. Like you have this mm -hmm. plastic container and you put it in the fridge and yeah. you kind of organize stuff. By now, yeah. you can produce them in like you can private label them in, in uh, Turkey. 
and it's going to be pretty mm. much the same price as in China. It's just you're not going to have the same import tax uh, mm. for the U.S., right, if you're selling in U.S. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So India is definitely really good, especially because they have a lot of different um, certification. Uh, sorry, uh, Turkey. Turkey, um, because Turkey sells a lot to European countries, uh, Germany, Austria, Italy. So they will have most of the certification that you will require for Europe and selling on the U.S. market as well. So, yeah, Turkey, take a look. They're quite good for uh, clothes, fabrics as well, right, Turkey? Uh, textiles, huge, textiles, huge, yeah. huge, 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 yeah. yeah. We've done quite a lot of products, especially, you know, all the bedding and stuff like this. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm waiting for we, we do like a lot of bedding, a lot of uh, a lot of different customers with a lot of brands. And I'm waiting for the one who will come to us and they're going to start producing, you know, Egyptian uh, uh, cotton sheets and stuff like this. And then I will order myself mm -hmm. samples as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But so far, no luck. Yeah, that that high thread count, yeah. Yes, exactly. Always wanted to thread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Um, you mentioned costs there of Turkey going to the US. Are the costs in any way comparable? Obviously, I know it's a broad question and the product depends and location depends. But if someone's looking at sourcing outside of China, what should they be expecting when it comes to costs? Dramatically more? Slightly more? What, what's your thoughts there? Um some of the products like textile products let's let's compare china versus uh turkey for example if you first of all go to if you do textiles you can also go to pakistan india bangladesh vietnam uh mm -hmm. indonesia those countries will be the same like china pretty much in terms of costing um turkey will okay. be a little bit more expensive but they will have more certification like oecotex and everything that relates to textiles as well uh, uh, Turkey uh, kind of has a little bit more uh, different FTAs, free trade agreements with countries across the globe. So you get uh, lower taxation in terms of import. Look, when you, on a lot of occasions, when we do calculations, um, it turns out that we're almost the same or maybe a little bit higher than in China. Um, but okay. your shipping is cheaper, your import tax is lower. And um, for a lot of people, you know, they would rather say made in Turkey than in China, right? Yeah. Especially in certain Perfect. countries. So, uh, yeah, sure. we're, there is a lot of like uh, textiles again, uh, Portugal, wonderful. People would say, oh, but this is Europe, this must be expensive. Of course, it's expensive, but not as expensive as you think. So people have, and this is what I'm trying to tell to the people. Why are you making assumptions without actually doing any research or talking to anyone, right? How much yeah. are the costs? Uh, because we produce tons in Portugal in terms of textiles and the prices are yeah. on par with what we can do in China. And it's in Europe. Mm. There's no import tax when we're selling in Germany or in, uh, you know, UK. Well, UK is a bit different, but, you know, it's wonderful. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you are sourcing in these locations, how do you go about finding the, the manufacturers? Because we've got a, a generation of e-commerce sellers that have been trained on Alibaba, you, you know, search for the product, reach out to the supplier, kind of does it all for you. Whereas oh, I know you can access different countries on Alibaba, but it's not quite as uh, no. sort of widespread, you know, Pakistan, Turkey, India, Bangladesh, wherever. How 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 do you go about initiating contact with these kind of suppliers and, and finding the best quality ones as well. So initially we did, again, I've been in the business for 18 years and I traveled around. So um, I always kind of collected the manufacturers from across the yeah. world, um, attending different trade shows. You know, uh, if you can't attend a trade show, uh, for example, uh, I think it's happening right now or just happened a, a week ago. There was a big trade show in India, in New Delhi, as far as I remember. As simple as that. Google what exhibits are there and look at the list of the exhibitors. Right? If you, you, mm -hmm. you have a list of the exhibitors, you will see what they do. Verify them, that's a different story. Um, you need to look, what we do is, of course, communication. You need to understand that they're not only legit, but that you can actually communicate with them. If, because if you can't, yeah, it's, yeah. It, 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 it's pointless. Um, we always check all of their legal documentation, making sure um, 
company is registered, that all the registrations are not run out, whatever certification they have, that it's all still valid and you need to recheck all of this online, that they're active and valid. Um, we usually go and reach out into the government resources to make sure that, yes, this company is legit. Because in today's day and age with AI, I can generate that uh, I'm the queen of England or sorry the king of England, let's put it this way. Um, yeah, so you need to do a lot of checks uh, like this. Yeah. But the first thing, if you don't have an opportunity to go to the trade shows, just find the trade shows in the country and look at the manufacturers. Um, another way uh, definitely is the use of social media, meaning when I'm going to a trade show, when we're exhibiting a Zignify Global Product Sourcing, we always post tons of content online, right? And we do hashtags and everything. So by this, and all the companies, all the manufacturers do the same thing. So by this, it's very, very, uh, you know, uh, easy potentially to find manufacturers as well. Um, by now, we have in like, do you know how many um, golden suppliers does Alibaba have? like suppliers who are not free, right? Because you have uh, yeah. like free suppliers mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. in total, Alibaba has more than 2 million. But how many actually golden yeah. verified suppliers does Alibaba have? You see, you're asking me all the hard questions here. I'm supposed to be asking you the hard questions. Um, I'm going to say uh, if it's 2 million, I mean, it's got to be, I don't know, 100,000 maybe? 200,000. Ooh, okay. But you were close. I mean, this is not bad, right? Um, and they have, I think, more than 20 million products actually listed on Alibaba, okay. right? Uh, I forgot. I think Crazy. 2,000 different categories, if I'm not mistaken. But um, my database, right? We properly started collating our database uh, when we started the company. And currently we have around about 50,000 manufacturers in our database from across the globe. Wow. And we increase it every, like, and only, I think, not even, half, no, maybe half of it is in China. Um, and it increases every day, right? Because we search for all new manufacturers every day. And by now, uh, yep. we're kind of known on the market. So companies come to us and say, oh, can you please put us in your database? We're like, okay, we will check. Mm -hmm. We will check. We'll see if you're good. If we will ever have anything, we'll reach out to you. Um, so yep. by now, they come to us, which is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And so when someone comes to you guys and says, I want you to help me source a product mm -hmm. and they tell you the product they're looking at, you've already got a list of suppliers that are approved that you've worked with that you know are good at what they do. Yes, but we don't only use them uh, for two reasons. Yeah. Honestly, first reason is because we want to increase our database. Right. So mm -hmm. we use maybe one. Uh, maybe if we if there is a product, uh, we will use maybe one third uh, of the suppliers from our database for the search. But yep. the rest we will search for new ones. The first reason we want to increase yep. our database, and that's an honest reason. Um, second reason is uh, we want to make sure that we have also the most innovative suppliers. There is so much innovation out there. There's new machinery, new technologies and everything popping out every single day. And I want to make sure that we don't miss out on anything, because if what if there is around the corner, the next generation of the suppliers who has the technology that will be able to decrease your price by 20 percent or 30 percent. Mm -hmm. Our goal is yeah. to get the best for the customers. And this is why another hard, not hard, easy question for you. Um, so <laughs> when you're doing when you're doing sourcing in China, right, we have a product yeah. Oh, here, let's source my tea, right? Uh, my delicious 0, 0.0 calories tea. Um, so we're doing this, how many manufacturers would you reach out to uh, when you're doing sourcing in China specifically? I would usually go for 10 to 15. Okay, which is not bad. We reach out to 30. Because we found that this number is uh, the number that gives us the most insight. Uh, because there's always that one or two guys after the number 15 that comes in and breaks the others and we just go with them. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. How many manufacturers in our company, we divide the world in two parts, China and ROW, rest of the world. For all those reasons we discussed, because China is the like... It's the factory, right? It's the world's factory. Mm -hmm. When you're doing sourcing in ROW, in rest of the world, how many manufacturers would you reach out? 
again, we're taking some oh. soft drink in, and we want to produce it in the United States of America. How many would you reach out to? Probably. I mean, I've not I've not done it uh, in the in the US, but probably two or three. I would have thought. Okay, about sixty. Wow. Okay. Because the conversion rate is very different. In China, yeah. out of 30 manufacturers, 30 will respond to you and 29 will give you prices. Whereas if you were doing this mm. in other countries, out of 60, 30 will respond to you after numerous calls and emails and maybe five will give you prices. The conversion rate is very different because as you said yourself, yeah. uh, there is no uh, there is no Alibaba, but the problem is even bigger. Mm. The factories are not as flexible as the Chinese are. I give you an example. Yeah. We have a customer. She's a lady from Singapore. Uh, her family, her husband's family, owns a production of lamps, right? Like lamps, night lamps and everything in Germany yeah. that are made out of wood. She wanted to produce and sell on Amazon and e-commerce, and she already does, a wooden lamp. Her husband's family factory could not do it. They produce wooden lamps. She wanted to produce a wooden lamp. The problem was they did not have an experience of dealing with an LED strip before. They only worked right. with bulbs. Yeah. This is the level of insanity that we're facing yeah, with yeah. some of the manufacturers. Yeah. I can well imagine it though, especially in the US. I imagine factories are just set up just to pump stuff out in one particular form. Whereas it, with e-commerce, as we all know, you need to differentiate and create added value to the products. And yeah, no, I can I can fully imagine that that's but things a, are a challenge when sourcing. No, no, but things mm. are changing. So you have some factories yeah. where that are owned across the globe. It's not only in developed countries in Europe, but we can take US as well. Old school factories mm. that have been there 20, 25 years, the owner is 55 year old white man no offense to 55 year old white men but that's just the statistics and mm -hmm. they are not hungry they have a few bmws mercedes whatever other cars people prefer a few houses rest like uh, travel the uh, holiday vacation home etc etc they're not hungry they're not hungry they're happy they have enough orders but then their children come and the children start taking over. And those guys, they might not be hungry for money, but they're hungry for doing something on their own, of achieving something on their own, not just, just with the help of daddy, right? So, and those guys, they're changing the factories. They start producing more products. They start private label, etc., etc. So now actually is a very good time uh, for people to start searching for manufacturing uh, outside of China because those factories are popping up everywhere. Prices are good. They do private label, even small MOQs. And people always say, oh, my God, the MOQs in Europe must be, or in US must be insane. I'm like, have you ever talked to one factory in US? No, but uh, oh, people make me want to cry sometimes. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's like maybe a bit of a therapy session. That's good. Get yeah. out. Um, when I, I know when I've used the sourcing agent before, um, like I, I've found it's, you know, I've got some really competitive pricing and I've told our community all the time, you know, uh, you, you of course pay for the service of a sourcing agent, but you, in their expertise, they're often able to get you a, a better price. I mean, would that be, without wanting to just answer your question for you, would that be your experience as well? You're managing to be quite competitive even with your, your fees in, included there because of the expertise, the relationships, et cetera, you built up? How does your, char uh, how does your sourcing agent charge you? Uh, like a percentage of the uh, order value. Yeah, we don't do that. You see, we're a lot cheaper because we only charge on an hourly base and our customers okay. can work with the manufacturer. They can take over and work with the manufacturer directly without us. So we implemented a very different yeah. strategy because we're at, we, because we're sellers ourselves. So when yeah. um, at some point in life, we were very busy and I wasn't able to do uh, sourcing ourselves and we were trying to hire sourcing agents and everyone percentage. I'm like, 
No, I want a better percentage. So, and yeah. I want to be in direct contact with the factory, right? I will pay for the work that you did, but I don't see why the person has to be paid over and over again. Um, again, as a seller myself, I know how much people are actually making and how much control they have over what, what is happening, which is almost none. Yep. So um, mm -hmm. I want control. So we want to give control back to the uh, sellers, no matter how you are. But look, the point being is, of course, there is a trade off. Um, you pay the money to get the best expertise uh, to make mm -hmm. sure that you have the free time to do what is really important meaning sell, 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 or maybe you're a business owner and your main business, because you already have a big team is to, you know, backend operations, or you're starting a different business. Yeah, look, we also hire people for our e-commerce businesses who manage our PPC and all of that. Can we do this ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yes, but I, I don't need them 24 hours or 48 or 72. I need like 150 hours in one day if I want to do everything on my own. So it's yeah. a trade-off. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, no, really good. I like it. You, um, you, you've talked obviously a lot about the, the quality and finding the manufacturers. A lot of people at the moment are struggling with squeezed margins, uh, you, you know, inflation on lots of different costs, Amazon fees, et cetera, et cetera. What are some of the things just to sort of round things off and, and finish up that you can share just about sourcing profitably? Because obviously as, as sellers, we try and negotiate, but the, of course there's the tension if you don't want to drive too low a price, so then the quality is affected. What are some expert insight you can give us there of finding good prices and good quality combined? Honestly, it's not an expert advice, it's a life advice. Be completely open and honest with your manufacturer. Tell him or her what is happening. Explain the situation. Be human. A lot of us, we don't, it, it's again, it's like, oh, a lot of people are treating the manufacturers like a kind of, a, I don't know, like a disposable thing or something. This is a wrong, wrong attitude. Having a relationship with a manufacturer is like having a marriage or a, it's a partnership. You need to build partnerships. Yeah. If you are talking to a manufacturer, you need, you know what we do we, when we were producing in Germany, when we, we were about to start producing in Germany, we came to our manufacturer, we showed him the potential. We went on Amazon, we used helium 10, we showed all the x-rays and here is the market. Da, 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 da. He's like, oh my God, gonna sell so many products, gonna make so much money, right? And we told him, this is the amount we're gonna sell for. And we know how much he's, how much we're gonna purchase. He's like, oh my God, your margins are gonna be huge. Then we literally wrote down for him da, 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 how much we're gonna have potentially at the end. He's like, ah, oh, so you pay for this and for that. A lot of manufacturers, they might not even understand this, right? So this mm. is the point where you need to explain to them the situation and say, guys, I'm not trying to, we all need, they need to make money and you need to make money. So you need to be open yeah. and honest with them and talk to them. Um, if you want to try and lie your way through it, they're just going to lie back and it's not going to help anything. Yeah. Do you oh, one, sorry, negotiate one thing. as well? Sorry, one Go thing. On, yeah. uh, uh, do you know about yearly contracts, annual contracts? No. Okay, annual contracts, this is a pretty cool thing because this potentially might get your price down by maybe not even 5%, but maybe 10%. So um, you can sign an annual contract with your potential manufacturer, right? And it doesn't apply only to China. And in this contract, you will state that, for example, throughout the year 2024, I agreed to purchase 10,000 pieces of this product but you will buy it right throughout the year. But at the end of the year, the total quantity will be 10,000. And for example, you take out 2000 pieces in February and you pay for that. And then when you take out the next one, you pay for this as well. So this way you commit to a larger quantity. You don't pay everything directly. You pay in parts only for what you're taking out and you can have a better price. A cynical person would say, well, I can just tell them that I'll do that. But then no, no, not you sign a contract. The other you sign yeah. a contract. Um, I mean, we can all try to cheat people, right? Uh, mm. I suppose if a person is like this, nothing is going to stop them. 
But you know, when I sign a contract, I kind of stand behind it. Uh, that that that's a human quality, yeah. qual, 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 not quantity, but that's a human quality already. Yeah. Yeah, of course, and I think that you know most people would would be like that. I'm just thinking from a perspective of say a new seller that launches a a product and tries to maybe use that tactic to get a cheaper price, and then the product doesn't sell as well as they would hope. Then maybe that's a tactic then to use for a more established product that you know you can most commit likely to yes, uh, most likely if you are just found a manufacturer uh, and you haven't even placed a trial order, they're not going to go for the first order as an annual order. They're not dumb yeah, either. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. Your, uh, when you go about your sourcing services, do you negotiate with the supplier as well in terms of getting the cost down? Yeah, of or is course. it just, uh, yeah. No, no, no. Our job control. is everything from uh, from product idea, product hunting to uh, delivering into 3PL or Amazon or anything. So negotiation, mm -hmm. um, uh, factory visits, like, oh, God, we have so many factory visits now planned during the Canton Fair. It's insane. We have so many customers uh, flying in because they want to go to Canton Fair, but they also want us to come along to the existing factories and see and communicate. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah it's, this is what any sourcing agent should do for you. You shouldn't be, uh, yeah. it shouldn't be even on a person's mind. Hey, guys, do you negotiate? this is my job this is you know why mm. because we don't work on a percentage so we negotiate yeah. the lowest moqs and the lowest prices because we don't get percentage out of it i don't care if you order 500 yeah. pieces or 5,000 pieces my job is to yeah. make sure that you get the best deal easy yeah hmm? and then you would do quality inspections as well after production yeah yeah in many different countries because um honestly like for our products the one that we order we do quality control. Uh, some of the factories we work with in China, we work with them for like seven years. Every time yeah. we do quality control, every single time. Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. Why do we do quality control every single time? Yeah, well, you, you mentioned 70% of the staff will turn over at Chinese exactly. New Year. So. Yes, someone listens to mm. me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Because staff is fluid, right? They change, they change. So whatever could have happened yep. one month, like in September, can be completely different in October. Um, so you need to make sure uh, the salesperson might be the same, but you don't know what's happening on the factory floor. So, yeah, you got to keep an eye. You need to, what I call it. You need to be a helicopter parent taka, 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 to make sure that everything's OK. Yeah, yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Uh, it it's so clear to me that you are just a, a genius on this topic. Uh, I'd love to sit here and ask you questions about this all day, but you're in Hong Kong. You're busy. You've got to talk tomorrow. So um, I, I'll let you go. But just before I do finish, is there anything that I haven't asked that's maybe like one last bit of advice or key that you think people need to know in the current market? Um, or have we covered everything you think? Um, when you're trying, look, uh, one of the tidbits, right? If you're trying to do sourcing, for example, outside of China, people are uh, always asking me, hey, how can I find countries where I can produce like this product? Uh, for example, wooden product, a wooden chair or a wooden table. I'm like, how about your Google? What are the top, uh, what are uh, the countries of top, manuf uh, top manufacturing countries of wood? Not right. So this is one of the things you need to look at um, when you're trying to source in out to do sourcing outside of China. First, you need to look by material, not by the product exactly, because a lot of the uh, companies, they don't even update their websites in Europe. You have a website from 1995, right? And, um, yes, search by material, right? Top countries that produce wooden products would be Russia, which is off the list right now. Canada, Canada ships their wood to China. So whatever products you produce out of wood in China, just produce them in Canada, right? You have India and a few other countries. And from there, you already have four or five countries. And then you say wooden chairs, India. And this way you kind of narrow your search down. So that would be a good tip. Good. Very good. I like it. Uh, where can people find out more about, about you, about your, your services? Uh, Zignified.net. That's we're very, very easy. Or LinkedIn, we're posting a lot. Or uh, our Instagram, I'm doing a lot of, because I was working walking through the trade show today. Well, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Potential product. Like one of those, you know that the, the O-ring thing, the smart ring and stuff like this? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, guess how much? Yeah, so yeah, the old ring sells them for about three hundred bucks, right? Plus you pay like mm. a weekly or monthly membership. How much do you think that mm -hmm. thing is in production? Oh, twenty dollars, thirty dollars. 
20 bucks. And this is 20 bucks without yeah. negotiation. So I think if we negotiate, we can get it down to maybe 18 or 15 or something like this. Yeah. And that's on the MOQ yeah. of 300 pieces. Can get that down probably to 100 pieces as well. <laughs> yeah, some of these products with that are like, I've got a tech element to them that make them seem more valuable. The margins on them is just... Oh, bonkers. Insane. Yeah. I know. You see, yeah. this is why I suggest to people right now, guys, go into the products that are more expensive. They're because, oh, they're mm. saying, oh, but recession and da, 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 da. People who bought expensive products, they will keep buying expensive products. Mm. Yes, a certain... Yeah. A certain um, level of people has suffered. The ones who had little money have even less. But the ones who were buying something for $300, they will keep buying it for three and for $500 as well. There is that market, even on Amazon. For sure. The rich get richer, hey? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, perfect. Well, we'll leave the uh, links for the um, for the website and social media, etc., in the show notes and the description, so people can check it out. Uh, Yulia, you've been such a valuable, valuable guest. Such knowledge. Uh, I really do appreciate you taking time out in your busy schedule to uh, to help our audience. So I yeah, think you're just you hyped on your on. coffee. <laughs> 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 no 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 it's true i feel it's true it's not the coffee talking <laughs> no pleasure is on mine it's always good to educate the community a little bit more because there's so much out there other than china look don't get me wrong the first time i came to china i it, it was 1993 i come from the border with china right for me it's like my second home i love it but the world is uh, quite big and has a lot of opportunities yeah. absolutely for sure Amazing. You're a legend. I appreciate it so much. Uh, well, guys, I'm, I'm sure you got uh, loads of value out of that as well. Check out Yulia's company, Zignify. Check out all of the social media. Connect on LinkedIn, all that good stuff. And check them out when you're sourcing a product wherever it is in the world next. Consider options beyond China because the world is your oyster out there. There are so many options available today. If you've liked this episode, please do give it a like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And we'll see you in the next episode, same time <laughs> next week. Take care. Bye-bye.